Okay, so uh, welcome everybody to LGBTQ plus Mental Health Hour. Um, I'm Lewis Turner. I'm Chief Executive of Lancashire LGBT, which is a pan-Lancashire charity. Uh, it's been in existence since 2009 and our core work is supporting LGBTQ plus people in Lancashire, across Lancashire, to be happier, healthier, better connected. So this is the first in a series of our LGBTQ plus mental health webinars. Um, one of the main reasons why we're running these webinars is, um, as I'm sure you're all aware, the COVID-19 pandemic and the lockdown um, impacted everybody's mental health. But we found through our research and also research has been by, done by other LGBT ch charities across the country have found that it's had a huge impact on um, the mental health and well-being of LGBTQ plus people. So we, we came up with this idea of, of running a series of webinars. And a lot of it was inspired by... Um, Sam Tyra and Dave Cottrell, who did uh, throughout last year, um, did mental health family hours, uh, which so it was really, really inspirational. They were very, very popular. Um, so Sam Tyra works for Lancashire and South Cumbria Foundation Trust. So a little bit of a nod to them. They know we're doing it. <laughs> we have their blessing to call it um, mental health hour, <laughs> even though they don't have the copyright on it. So this is going to be a conversation tonight with our, our support worker, Beth uh, and Brian. Uh, about how we as LGBTQ plus people can be resilient and how self-acceptance in an environment which sometimes can feel not very accepting of our identities. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, this webinar is being recorded and at the end of the webinar, we'll be uploading it onto our YouTube channel afterwards, which means that other people will be able to see it as well. If you want to see uh, our British Sign Language interpreter, Mark, our, a bit bigger if you want to see a bigger view for him you can right click on his video so just right click on um the video that says mark bsl interpreter and i believe it, it he'll become bigger um so you're all automatically muted um but you're welcome to use the chat facility for comments uh, which i'll be moderating um however we might not have time to take additional questions other than those that you have the opportunity to to give out when you filled in the registration form um, we don't have the capacity in this session to offer individual mental health support, unfortunately. Um, so just use the chat for comments. Um, as I say, I'll be moderating um, and I might feedback some, some of the uh, comments back to uh, Beth and Brian at the end of the session um, if I get an opportunity. Um, at the end of this session, um, we will be emailing you evaluations. It'll be a very, very quick online evaluation form. And I would please, please, please <laughs> ask you to uh, fill in the evaluations, particularly because this is our first webinar. So we want to know what worked and what didn't work. Um, did, it, did it work for you or not? Uh, we've, we've got opportunity to give us suggestions um, and tell us what went right or wrong. Uh, so we'd really, really, be, really be pleased if you could just take the time to do that. It'll only take you a couple of minutes. It's a very, very quick online evaluation sheet. Um, so that'd be really, really useful. And finally, uh, before we make a start, we're really pleased to announce that there's a forthcoming radical self-care course coming up, which is run by Lancashire Mind and Rainbow Mind, specifically for LGBTQ plus people in June. So this will be um, an eight week session, uh, two hour sessions for over eight weeks. And it's particularly focusing on radical self-care for LGBTQ plus people. There was a pilot done of this um, somewhere else in the country uh, a little while ago and uh, had fantastic feedback and it was evaluated by universities so great i read all the evaluations um, and it, it worked really really well so i would strongly recommend um signing up to that so um we'll be sharing as soon as we get the online registration forms we get find out more about it we'll be sharing that on our social media on our um We've got a newsletter that we send out as well. Um, and we, I suppose we could actually even send you the information about these, um, about this, this radical self-care uh, course as well via email if, um, if you like, but I'm not sure if we can because, uh, but yeah, let us know if you're interested. That's probably the easiest thing, drop us an email. Um, so I'm gonna hand over now to uh, Beth and Brian. 
Thank you, Lewis. And thank you, everyone, for attending this evening. We're really excited to launch the LGBTQ plus mental health hour. So, yeah, my name's Beth. I'm the support worker at Lancashire LGBT. And without further ado, I want to introduce Brian. So I'll do a little bit of a summary of his uh, amazing trajectory, really. So Brian dalgrish Warburton is an accredited physio psychotherapist with the BABCP, a registered member of the BACP and an accredited EMDR practitioner. Brian is a senior lecturer at UCLAM, where he teaches in the School of Community Health and Midwifery. And he has just last night um, officially become the first openly gay mayor of Longridge, which is an uh, incredible achievement. So congratulations, Brian, and thanks for being here. Thank you. <laughs> That's brilliant. So <laughs> It's a pleasure to be here. Good. I'm glad that you're here. And let's just get straight into it, I guess. Um, where did it all begin for you? I think it's interesting to go to your background and, you know, particularly where you trained at Whittingham Hospital and the little bit of history there. So, yeah, if you want to sort of speak to that initially and we can go from there. Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, I think uh, my background in terms of working in mental health, um, I, I suppose, starts with sort of some sense of uh, identity in terms of um, family, you know, so mum was a general nurse, uh, both my elder brothers were in, uh, worked in mental health as well. So um, originally I um, tried to run away from that and lived in a religious community for a while and wanted to train to be a vicar instead. Um, uh, but then I ran away from that when um, I got to know a little bit more about myself in terms of my own um, sexuality. Uh, uh, my sexual orientation um, and um, so I ended up um, uh, on a, a mental health nursing um, course training course at Whittingham Hospital. Um, I knew the hospital quite well anyway um, in terms of my grandma had been a, a patient there <clears throat> in um, older what was older adults then um, in St. Margaret's uh, Hospital, which is part of the, the bigger uh, bigger hospital network. Um, and uh, so when I started training, I actually probably still knew some of the, um, the people who uh, were resident there. And of course, Whittingham Hospital, when it started, was the second largest um, institution of its kind, mental health institution in Europe. So it had um, thousands of, uh, of people who were resident there. Um, and the history is quite, I think um, the history is really important because uh, it also has uh, within that history, some of the history of for us as an LGBT uh, plus uh, LGBTQ plus community. Um, so, you know, many of the people who were still there uh, when I started and when the closure of Whittingham Hospital took place uh, had been put into hospital for stealing um, a loaf of bread or a sixpence or having a child out of wedlock or being gay, um, lesbian or um, um, who, uh, sexual behaviour not fitting with um, the norm of society, which was kind of um, in sort of Victorian kind of norm. But many of those people were in their 80s or 90s. Um, uh, and we're still in that hospital um, wow. when I started training. Um, and I think that's really per pertinent for me in terms of my own uh, orientation, um, being a gay man, and then um, in my experience in terms of mental health as well. Yeah, yeah. I know when we discussed before that history is, is it's troubling, but it's also kind of poignant that then you've gone on to, as a gay man, be a mental health practitioner. Um, okay, so you trained there. And then obviously you've had much, uh, you have a different, loads of different practices that you're accustomed to. And I don't know whether you're going to speak through some of those because obviously there's lots of different ways to approach mental health and you seem skilled in so many different areas. So, yeah, so I think kind of um, I, I then went on to train in, um, I was particularly interested in um, psychotherapy and mm -hmm. uh, th through luck really more than anything else, I ended up on a, um, um, a um, qualifying course in cognitive behavioral psychotherapy um, and and that that was fine that, that was really good it gave me some um, some helpful skills um, to support uh, other people um, but I, I kind of um, I think for me it was about not fitting um, 
the client into the strategy around um, mental health. So it was then important for me to think about, well, actually, are there other therapies out there? Um, mm -hmm. Are there other ways of working with people, other ways of understanding people? Um, so I've probably been on about a, a, a 30 year journey then in training in a variety of different therapies, um, including CBT, um, so, um, Rogerian um, principles of counseling, um, psychodynamic um, yeah. therapy, uh, brief psychodynamic therapy, um, but also uh, so I find very interesting and very powerful um, in the work that I do uh, is compassionate mind. Um, so compassion focused therapy and uh, mindfulness, for example. Um, and there's, there's probably others as I go along and I've ended up yeah. teaching these now, which is really exciting. Um, and there isn't a day that isn't full of joy and excitement in terms of my job role, whether it's teaching or, um, mm. or listening to people or trying to help people. I think it's a gift that um, I'm not saying a gift that I've been given to help people, but I think it's a gift to spend time with people. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's, that's so interesting. And now I understand that you take quite an integrated approach with the different therapeutic models that you've picked up along the way. Yeah. So it's back to the idea of not, um, not trying to integrate the, the client into mm. the therapy, but wrapping the therapy around the client. And that Absolutely, means being yeah. able to choose strategies that work with individuals differently. Um, and not every strategy is going to work with every person that you meet. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's really important to understand, isn't it? Um, okay. So thinking about, you know, the themes of tonight around identity, shame and self-acceptance, um, maybe you could speak to more of those specific themes and how they relate to obviously LGBTQ plus mental health and the support that people can get. Yeah. So I, I, it's, it's, yeah, I, I um, so I was te I was actually teaching today this afternoon for a couple of hours on a similar uh, similar subject and um, and uh, and I, I I I got over excited and I'll probably get over excited again talking about this but um, okay. <laughs> I, I um, that there's um, a very old kind of theory um, which is called Maslow's hierarchy uh, yeah. of needs and we you know um, and it's there at the center of psychological training whatever it is whether it's you do an undergraduate course in mm -hmm. psychology or whether you do an A-level in psychology um, we always start with that fundamental principle um, of mm -hmm. Maslow's hierarchy um, and it's like having two triangles with, <laughs> uh, because the other hierarchy is all ports scale of prejudice um, and uh, now those people who don't know about Allport, Allport was also a psychologist like Maslow, but Allport wanted to look at um, how in um, Nazi Germany, um, a, um, a, a country, a, a group of people wanted to wipe out another group of people, um, so the Jewish community. Um, so he wanted to understand how that happened um, and he, he came up with um, uh, a hierarchy that was based around the fact that the initial stage is anti, what we call anti-locution. So the fact that we all um, uh, engage sometimes in spiteful gossip. We mm. all use words without thinking that can be hurtful for others. Um, we all stereotype um, or we all um, end up internalizing to some extent. So whether it's internalized homophobia or mm -hmm. internalized oppression, uh, we end up going with stereotypical roles. But then what happens is that gives permission for a smaller group of people to um, actively avoid so, you know, whether that's avoiding um, or, or not giving a service to somebody um, um, or not sending our children to a school because it's teaching L uh, something around LGBT history or um, and then that in turn gives a smaller group of people the permission to physically be via uh, to well to be prejudiced um, and to discriminate mm -hmm. um, and, and that might bring in sort of institutional um, isms in there as well mm -hmm. and then that gives a smaller group of people the opportunity the permission to be violent and that right. gives a smaller pe uh, group of people the um the permission um to try and wipe out a whole group of people whether that's mm -hmm. a, a, a gay community by bombing a, a, a pub or whether that's so it, it's in a way it starts with that the the bottom part which we all have a role and responsibility in in society mm -hmm. but alongside that 
is the um, the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah. And when we cross those two over and we start thinking about how that oppression and how that um, the language or whether it's the uh, discriminatory activity, the prejudice, how that impacts on people, mm -hmm. then you understand that you end up with a first of all sort of no no warmth no safe safe place no sense of identity um, home isn't safe or the community isn't safe for somebody um, mm -hmm. so even before you start engaging in the later aspects of therapy there's something about grounding people in safety um, yeah. and and uh, feeding people keeping people warm clothing people etc mm -hmm. we haven't to forget that and then then it's working up that hierarchy, Maslow's hierarchy, in terms of then um, that sense of identity. Um, and, and that's where I would start then with that particular person starting to work on their personal values. I'll come back to that maybe in a moment or two. Yeah. Um, and, um, and there's a type of therapy called acceptance and commitment therapy, um, which we would kind of, um, okay, well, actually, what are your personal values? What do you aspire to be? Uh, what do you aspire to, to live like? Um, and um, enable that person to start to align themselves closer to their personal values. Mm -hmm. And then the next steps up that Maslow's hierarchy uh, to that sense of community and a sense of belonging and connecting people really um, mm -hmm. with others who are going to be accepting and understanding. Um, and then beyond that into self-actualization, whatever that might look like for an individual, um, mm -hmm. I guess. Yeah. Um, that's really interesting. I'm just thinking for anyone who's never heard of Maslow's hierarchy before. I know you explained it there, but maybe just go through those stages just about the hierarchy, just in case anyone was um, yeah, sure. hadn't, hadn't heard of it before, you know. Fine. So that first that first stage um, is and, and, and I think often it's something that is forgotten about in terms of uh, when clients come for if, if a client approaches or comes for therapy or is referred. Um, that first stage is um, is, is about um, having um, having a roof over uh, over your head, having um, um, a radiator, um, having heat. Um, having a belly that's full, um, mm -hmm. um, having water or, um, or the ability to boil a kettle and, and, and um, make a, a cup of coffee, the very mm -hmm. basics of, of life. Mm -hmm. And we often forget that actually those aren't accessible for some people. You're mm -hmm. thinking about um, the young person who's coming out, whose family um, decide that um, they um, um, don't want that person living with them and, and that person then they, they become homeless and, and disconnected from all of those basic needs being met yeah. um, or the person who's transitioning mm -hmm. um, and um, they're, they're having to, to um, they're leaving a life a complete change maybe they lose their job maybe they disconnect from the family their family don't want to speak to them again mm -hmm. um maybe their children don't want to speak to them again a whole change all those basic needs then uh, aren't met and before you can work with a sense of shame or a sense of guilt or a sense of loneliness we've got to work with that first layer of maslow's hierarchy yeah because without it, it doesn't have to be completely fulfilled it has to be enough yeah. So then that person, the next stage of the hierarchy is safety. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and that's maybe where we kind of look at risk assessment and ensure that somebody is, is safe, safe to themselves uh, in terms of their own personal vulnerability um, and being able to um, engage with that individual to help them uh, not only to connect with others, but just to feel a sense of safety. Yeah. Um, and that might be negotiating with um, uh, councils. I suppose that's where it comes in handy being the mayor. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but negotiating with councillors and, and other organisations to try and help to find um, home um, yeah. um, um, so that, that, that there is a place of, uh, of safety. Mm -hmm. And then Mas Maslow's hierarchy of needs goes in then to this idea of community. Yeah. Um, that we're as human beings, um, we we need a sense of um, belonging. Um, a, it, it's kind of like um, a sense of gravity. Yeah. Um, that helps us to stand. Um, and um, and and everybody has different aspects of self in terms of whether they feel, um, you know, whether they're antisocial. You know, I, I, I'm 
I like to think I'm social, but I'm probably slightly antisocial occasionally. <laughs> um, and um, but that's a choice for me. For mm-hmm. some people, it isn't. Um, but it is still a sense of community, and particularly. I, I can remember coming out myself and not knowing. It's back in, um, it'd be in the a, late 80s, early 90s, um, and not so sure where to go. Um, yeah. It was only through um, luck, really, through conversation that I found that there was a, a gay pub in Preston, um, mm-hmm. which was the Mitre Tavern, um, if anybody um, kind of knows that, but um, which just had one gay night um, on half of one side of the pub. Um, right. <laughs> but for me going out there that's where I met my husband for the first time but um 30 years ago but for, for me that was um suddenly a sense of oh there's these are the people <laughs> yeah that exist and I could ask silly questions or I could um be myself in some way so yeah. that that sense of community and then after that it's going into that sense of clear identity in terms of your own goals uh, where you want to be um, that sense of belonging in self Mm -hmm. and then self-actualization right at the top which can be absolutely anything it could I I don't think I've ever reached self-actualization in one peak but it's about um uh, getting my bling on last night as mayor getting my bling was a moment of self-actualization I've never had bling oh yeah (laughs) Um, and um um or getting the the job at UConn is self-actualization um uh, coming home to my husband each day that's self-actualization um so it, it can be anything for anybody but you need don't need all of those areas fully fulfilled but you need Um, building blocks that you can walk up yeah but that's very interesting and it also emphasizes the role of you know agencies like Lancashire LGBT and other support services like mental health and otherwise you know you spoke about housing for example there's those practical things that need to be met in order to to have those needs that are essential met and yeah what you're saying about the community well you know of course we recognize that that's even more important for LGBTQ plus people because they're so marginalized and have been over the years um, and therefore when you do find that queer community and and it feels so great there's a reason why behind that really isn't there yeah and I I think kind of um and, and I I still think kind of back down to some of those basic needs as well because um I mean I was talking to um um, somebody who um, they'd been in a um, lived in a war torn country. They'd come over here um, for a sense of um, safety. They were suffering from PTSD. They were suffering from um, trauma. Mm-hmm. Um, um, but before you can treat the trauma, before you can treat the PTSD, um, you've got to address the needs of um, the fact that they felt safe for the first time, but they had mm-hmm. no heating. Mm-hmm. They had no gas or electricity. Um, they had no bedding. They had no probably a, a few a few items of clothes, but no more. Mm-hmm. And so those are the those are the things first of all to 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 make sure that they're there for people and then build up from there. Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. And that's really interesting to think about it in that way. Um, I wonder if you touched on it a little bit. Some of your personal experiences, obviously, as a gay man. I didn't know whether you wanted to share any other anecdotal or, or experiences in relation to mental health and a journey that you've been on there? Um, yeah, I, I think um, there are key turning points um, in, um, if I think about my own personal history in terms of um, sexual orientation and and well-being mm-hmm. um and when we talk about mental health i think we kind of uh, talk about mental illness but actually we all have mental health mm-hmm. yes. um yeah. and we all have well-being it's it's how that that fluidly changes for us and what impacts on us mm-hmm. um and the things that kind of made a difference to me those key turning points have usually been people um okay. so um uh, key people that have introduced me to other people and other people that have then introduced me to others who um, I kind of then learned my sense of history from so I remember somebody giving me a, a pink triangle and telling me the history of the pink triangle when I was very young um, and then wearing it with pride wherever I went um yeah <laughs> um introducing me to literature or, or um introducing me to um um other people in the LGBT 
Q plus community and um, or um, guiding me to um, Basel's in Blackpool um, for a night out. Um, so so again, it's not it's not magical, but it's it's about um, um, key people. And I think that's again, there's a risk here because this is about um, uh, and it's a conversation I had to, today is uh, with some trainee therapists is that as a therapist, um, it's our job that we're looking after often or engaging with people, uh, having a conversation with people who are the most vulnerable or who are feeling very vulnerable. So as they start to explore themselves and start mm -hmm. to engage with others who are key turning people or guides on their journey, those guides have to be trustworthy. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's sometimes it's very hard to know, um, particularly if you're vulnerable. Um, if that's the case. So that's why I think it's important that like L L um, Lancashire LGBT um, uh, as being a, um, a stopping point for that um, yeah. and, and connecting in and finding uh, groups that exist locally um, that are bona fide, uh, if mm -hmm. you like. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's it's so important and just through the work that you know we do at Lancashire LGBT and for example uh, we recently set up a LGBT, LGBT women's and non-binary um, peer support group and that's just been invaluable to so many people and such a great atmosphere and there's a, such an element of trust there and like you said you need to know that if you are vulnerable and you're leaning on people that they're people you can trust and and feel safe with and yeah I'm happy that as an organization we can facilitate spaces like that and there's so many other agencies that do that as well so it's really important mm. um yeah I don't know whether you want to speak a little bit to can some kind of maybe more general tips that could okay. perhaps help people who are LGBTQ plus and struggling with their mental health of course like you say, we all have mental health, which is a really important point to remember, and it varies across person to person. But if there's any kind of more general guidance that you think could be could be useful. Yeah, sure. And, and I think kind of these are things that I, I practice with clients, but there are also mm -hmm. things that I practice myself um, um, as best I can. I think it's important that if I'm engaging with somebody in therapy, for example, that, yeah. and, and I'm giving them homework to do or uh, a task to do in between session um, whether that's calm breathing or whether that's um, a diary sheet um, or whether that's an experiment or, or, or something that they need to report back on and we have a conversation about and um, then these are things that I make sure that I've done or I'm trying myself and sometimes I'll engage alongside the client so if I'm setting a diary sheet I'll say well I'll do the same thing and then let's have a look and compare and contrast yeah that's nice um, which is it's important because actually you need to be at a, um, uh, a level, the power differential in, in terms of just attending somewhere for therapy and engaging with a therapist. We, we, we need to understand that and take account of that. So um, I, I fill my day. I mean, I'm... Um, uh, I'm my own worst enemy for being busy. Yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, if somebody says, can you, I'll put my hand up and say, yeah, me, 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 me. Um, I'll, I'll do that. Um, do you want to come on to a uh, YouTube channel with LGBT uh, lecture? And, That's it. Yeah, of course. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, and um, so I think it's important to stop at least once or twice in the day and ground myself or to ground yourself or, or whoever and grounding um, for me means connecting back with um, the earth literally putting my feet into the floor stamping my feet into the floor feeling mm -hmm. the, my feet under the floor being mindful of where I am mm -hmm. you know looking around the room naming a couple of objects that I can see so I can see um, uh, two green dogs um, they're not real they're pot dogs on my shelf up here um, my <laughs> dogs aren't green um, and um, you know I can see my kettle because I'm sat in my kitchen um, come slash office um and um to listen and hear do you hear any sounds so i particularly like doing this sat in the garden because i can hear birds outside in the garden um or my dog barking um <laughs> and um any smells i mean i'm not particularly good with smells i usually have a bit of a blocked nose but um i've got a um, bottle of aftershave on here so I can smell that. Um, and so grounding myself into that present moment, being aware of what's around me and even the simple things, 
of when you can, uh, looking at the weather through my Velux window, um, when you get sitting out in the garden and just sitting with a cup of tea or a cup of coffee and not doing anything, even if it's for five minutes. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and sometimes just walk around the garden and just have a look and see if anything's actually coming up now and growing. Um, and so, so that grounding can be, I think, really important and just stopping. Now, if then you, com you, you kind of um, combine that with just breathing, so again, this is nothing like um, dead posh and therapy <laughs> posh, you know, this is it, it's um, so breathing in through the nose calmly taking a nice deep breath in because when we're, we're uh, anxious, we breathe from our chest, uh, from our top part of our chest, we want to breathe from our diaphragm. So taking those nice three calm breaths in, breathing in, holding the breath and then breathing out following the breath with the rise of the shoulders and the rise of the chest. Um, and so combining that with the grounding and the breathing and then getting on, carrying back on again, but remembering to do that again a little later. Yeah. A really difficult thing right now for people, and this has been very difficult for me because I am a person orientated individual, is that sense of connection with other people. Yes. Uh, and this isn't connection. This is okay, it suffices, it will do. Um, but we need to read body language, even if mm -hmm. we're not hugging, even if we're um, not sat next to each other, we need that sense of body language, that sense of eye contact, the smile without the mask, um, hopefully. Um, but it's that sense of um, being, to, being together. So again, if you can um, go and gossip, no spiteful gossip, but just a little <laughs> bit of gossip will do, um, and, and connect with somebody else. And that's really, really, really important. If you haven't got anybody else to connect, that's when Lancashire LGBT and other uh, community organizations become really, really important. But then that leads me to another thing in terms of um, I think we can easily live this internalization or oppression or internalized homophobia um, uh, or inter uh, internalized any um, hate really. And um, so the other, the other aspect that I think is really important in terms of well-being, and again, it's something I practice, is that sense of self-compassion. Yeah. So drawing on the model of compassion-focused therapy is this idea that sometimes it's easier. If we see our friends suffering, it's so easy to go over and sit by our friend, put our arm around them, say to them softly, it's okay, it's okay. You're not suffering alone with this. I'm here. I might not be, you know, I might be able to change it, but I'm here with you and I'll, I'll walk through this with you. I'm mm -hmm. not going anywhere. Um, and we would always approach a friend like that. But if it's us in trouble, if we're feeling anxious about something, if we're feeling sad about something, the internal voice, the um, if, if you like, um, the punitive critic or the bully voice um, actually says, come on, you can do better. Pick yourself up. Come on, work harder. Oh, you're just stupid. You know, there's all of those internalized kind of uh, uh, voices. So I think there's something about stopping and putting your hand on your heart. And actually being self-compassionate and saying it's okay. It's okay to feel crap. It's mm -hmm. okay to make mistakes. It's okay to feel alone right now. I understand that. Yeah. And it's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and to use that same approach that you would use with a friend yeah. to yourself. That takes work. That's why people come into therapy and we engage and, and, and practice that. Um, but I think those three techniques um, can be very, very helpful. Mm -hmm. Um, as well as those things that I kind of say about maintaining some sense of connection uh, with others around us. Yeah. Writing a, a diary and challenging your thinking is also useful. Um, naming the type of thinking. So I'm a good catastrophizer. I can catastrophize really easily. But if I write that thought down and recognize it and na label it catastrophization, I can then think, mm, I wonder if my best friend was um, mm. thinking this, what would I say to them? If, um, if my best friend knew I was thinking like this, what would they say to me? Mm -hmm. um, and just help us to re reassess that thinking. And sometimes that can be quite helpful too. Yeah, it's, it's interesting because it's all relatively simple things, but they're actually quite hard to, I suppose, recognize and employ in your daily life. But I particularly love the idea of, you know, treating yourself as your own best friend and how you would be compassionate to a family member or a friend or a colleague like why wouldn't you give yourself that treatment that same treatment 
Yeah, and and if I was working with a client, we'd we would develop a compassionate um, a compassion bag that they could um, take okay. with them in places or put into the um, uh, the handbag or um, put in the um, pocket or carry with them or have in the car. Um, so the, in that ba- in that bag would be um, so for one client in the bag was a lavender spray. Yeah. So they could spray the lavender spray on them and smell that. And that helped to ground them, but it also helped to uh, relax them. Um, uh, there was um, um, a card that reminded them of a mantra that was actually um, the self-compassion, uh, the compassionate voice saying to themselves, you know, you're you're strong or you're loved or, or, or whatever it is that feels really important for them. Um, uh, working with clients in terms of, um, with regards to this, is, is also looking at material or a photograph or um, something that kind of um, focuses in the senses in terms mm. of a safe place or a comfortable place or a calm place. And then I'll do imagery work with the client, but they'll use that reminder that's in their compassion bag. Mm. Um, so they've got a number of tools that they can take with them um, that yeah. remind them. Um, of how to engage in these activities and that can be re- a really useful strategy because um, remembering to do all of these is really hard but if you've got something that's physical that reminds you of that yeah yeah that's really important so I suppose yeah people listening now if they're struggling and you know one is there's a lot of tips there to go off really and some like you know quite practical things like this whole yeah. compassion bag like that that could have an impact couldn't it positively it could, and I, I think the other thing is that I, I deal with kind of, um, I, I listen and hear a lot of people talk about loneliness. Yeah. Um, and loneliness is so powerful. Um, and you can feel lonely in a crowd. So that yeah. loneliness is not about um, being with other people, but, but loneliness is about being with yourself. And there is something about, I kind of, I've got the voice of RuPaul in my head. If you can't <laughs> love yourself, who can you love? Can I have an amen? Um, <gasps> Um, <laughs> and, um, and there is some sense of truth in that. I don't think wholly 100%, um, but there is some sense of truth in that about um, if you can sit with yourself in a compassionate way and value yourself, yeah. then actually it becomes, um, the loneliness becomes a little easier to be able to, um, to live with. Um, so it does start with self-compassion and mm. but it also I think starts with the recognizing well what is it that you value what are your values for life mm. um, and there's a, um, a task that we sometimes do with clients or I do we, we, we work together on a, with clients and that is to have a look it's called acceptance and commitment therapy and it it looks at kind of well what are your main values so you know what are your values about work what are your values about spirituality what are your values about your sexuality what are your values about family about being a partner about being a father or a mother or a daughter or a son um, and so we start looking at those values and naming them and we look at ideally how they would like their values to be Because if you're not living, the further away you are from living those values, the unhappier you are. The closer you get to living those values, the happier you can be. So we start realigning those values then together based upon where they are in their journey, whether that's a journey of transition, for example. Um, And then we look at, well, actually, if that's your goal to get this close or work in this way with that value, Mm -hmm. how can we work together to help you to get to that where you aspire to be? And then we can develop a plan. Yeah. Um, and we can problem solve that and we can look at different solutions to be able to move towards that um, that goal if you like yeah um, that's the usefulness of having that conversation in terms of well, what are my values what's really important to me yeah and that can of course be an internal conversation obviously as well with a therapist mm. is ideal but for people who you know yeah. are sat, are sat here today and wondering that that could be an internal conversation to be had um, there's lots of free materials out there. So actually there's a really, really good website, um, which um, um, it's not mine. I don't get paid, paid for um, <laughs> kind of um, um, plugging it, but um, uh, cbtgetselfhelp.co.uk. Um, okay. 
and um, that's that's worth having a look. So lots of material on there. There's material about mindfulness, um, some short courses in seek cognitive behavioral therapy. Mm. The ACT sheets that I were talking about in terms of values are on there. Um, there's some guidance around self-compassion. Um, so there's lots of nice things on there that you can use and have a look Great. at. And lots of short video clips as well. That's really good. Thank you for sharing that. Um, hopefully that's useful to the audience it's members. Therapist secret. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so just thinking back on, you know, the identity, shame and self-acceptance, what I'm kind of, you know, concluding from the things that you were saying are that you've got to kind of work through the shame in order to get closer to the identity. And then ultimately the self-acceptance is, is really the most important part in a way because if you can accept yourself then it intersects the identity as well I guess and it can all feel more manageable and better so I think yeah but I think kind of to add into that I um I think that shame is, is also about working with that internalized uh, oppression yeah. as well and recognizing that because we can find ourselves in that sort of that process there's a mental defense mechanism um in um uh, psychodynamic called, called reaction formation mm -hmm. um and reaction formation is when the thing that you feel about yourself that you know about yourself but you don't like about yourself mm -hmm. you find in someone else and when you found it in them you can reject it by being hostile and horrible to them and um, so I, I often kind of um when I've met homophobia uh, myself so sat in um um starbucks um obviously in the days when we could go inside a course, cafe yeah. the good old days <laughs> and they're coming soon we hope but um uh, and um this group of men um so i had my i was working for the um nhs then so i had my nhs lanyard which was my lgbt one mm -hmm. um and um these workmen that they were staring over at myself and my husband uh, we, um, i was fairly oblivious but my husband was very uncomfortable we ended up yeah. leaving our, our drinks shouldn't have needed to do that no. um i got up to the door to move um, and they came forward and almost walked through me in a very mm. aggressive way mm -hmm. um and so it felt unsafe to challenge so yeah. i kind of um i walked to we walked away from that i did contact starbucks and and tell them how lonely that felt and how yeah. oppressive that felt and why were they must have noticed and why didn't they help me so of course they sent me two nice free coffees um <laughs> Uh, that made things much better but um and you might notice slight sarcasm there but yeah um i think um in terms of uh, dealing with that um for me i then look at that the, those people and think well actually that's possibly for some of those reaction formation that actually maybe that some of those are dealing with their own internalized homophobia that one yeah. or two of those might be gay themselves and mm -hmm. it's very difficult for them to actually manage that so they push it on to me now if I, we call that formulating so when i formulate it that way it makes me feel actually much better yeah um, <laughs> as um as well but i think in turn of, in terms of that self actual that self-acceptance we've got to kind of recognize when we're internalizing things as well um and and maybe question that and and, and explore that uh that too yeah that's great thanks brian so that's going to kind of conclude the discussion part just because mm. obviously we were a little bit pushed for time actually and it's flown by and been I, in my view very interesting so I'm going to move on to the questions now we've got four and hopefully we'll be able to get through them all so the I'll just read them out and um, the first one is any quick tips for building resilience also any advice on how to address being LGBT plus or trans with a child um, who's eight years old and a family member who's non-parental prioritizing their mental health so yeah so that's a difficult question to answer i think kind of in terms of the um first part of the question mm -hmm. is exactly what we were talking about before in terms of resilience uh, resilience is a strange word um because often kind of people talk about it being bounce back um mm -hmm. and that means that you can bounce back from from things but actually if you're always bouncing back from something um then eventually you're not going to be as resilient because you're not learning from what happened right so i think yeah. in terms of resilience it's about um being able to recognize your 
um, I and mean, we call them precipitating or perpetuating factors, but the things that actually impact on your wellness. Mm. Um, so, so having a plan for your own wellness, having a plan for your own child's wellness, um, being able to think about, well, actually, these are the things that are really important. When we're feeling good, why are we feeling good? What are the, th the key things that are around at the time when we're feeling good? And how can we replicate that? How can yeah. we sustain the things that help us to feel good? And that's probably more of the question that we should be asking, a bit more of a positive psychological question, but how can we sustain that? And then from that, working out the things that help us to be um, more resilient. And again, back to that sense of hierarchy in terms of Maslow's hierarchy and mm -hmm. um, ensuring people have got warmth, a place of safety, sense of community, a sense of love, um, yeah. whether that's uh, for themselves or, or through from somebody else, connecting in with, with others uh, as well. So that would be around the resilience and, and maybe that's working on some of the facts we talked about before, grounding, breathing, etc. Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so the next question um, is around self-acceptance and it's how can I best support my questioning teenager in terms of actively encouraging self-acceptance? I, I suppose the first thing is it's really positive that there's some sense of questioning. Yeah. So, you know, questioning is so important. And I think it's about, um, I, I think if I think back to my own sort of LG kind of experience in terms of my own sexual orientation, there wasn't anyone to ask those questions to. Right. Or to explore them with. Um, and, um, and, and also to be honest, I mean, when I came out, I came out at 15, my mum gave me the well go and have sex with a woman and, and then um you'll you'll know your true self you know mm -hmm. um because i never did that i just went away but even more confused um mm -hmm. so the fact that they're asking questions is to be applauded and encouraged mm -hmm. and so value that um and provide a, a an open and valuing environment that enables them to ask questions if you can't answer the question that's fine too um you, you say that i don't know but let's find out together yeah. And then you can you can mirror um, problem solving and you can mirror um, all of the skills of communication and, and how to look and find and seek uh, the answer to that. Um, so I think kind of it's, it's about that openness, about valuing the questions being asked. Um, and if you can't answer, then helping someone to look look together. Um, yeah. And find the answers. I think it's such an important point, you know, we mentioned it before about if you need to support someone, it's just about not necessarily having all the answers, but just that solidarity that, oh, well, I'm here and I know this is awful for you, but you've got someone, you know, we can get through this together, even though I can't fix it for you type thing. Yeah. And I, and I think kind of sense of service if, um, um, when people feel so vulnerable that um, they feel so alone and, yeah. and, potentially then think about taking their own life, for example. And, mm. and I've, I've helped some people um, with those experiences. It, it is when they have a sense of um, they're disconnected and have no sense of uh, ability to ask those questions um, mm -hmm. and they feel all alone with that. Yeah. So the fact that, you know, kind of we can provide an environment for a young person to ask questions openly is so important, so valuable yeah. and, and, and to be encouraged warmly. Yeah. Yeah. It comes back to that loneliness, doesn't it? Um, OK, so the next question is what advice would you give to someone who has been on the waiting list for the gender identity clinic for a long time and who has massive, massive mental health problems due to gender dysphoria? Yeah. So I think uh, it was a combination for me, the uh, combination. I mean, you need to know, I'd need to know more about the individual, for example, mm -hmm, um, so that sure. we can tailor, I could tailor uh, things around, particularly for, for the individual's needs. Um, but for people that I have supported, it's back down to th the values um, and being able to engage with your values now as you uh, wait to. Um, to begin the process of transitioning or as you move into that transitioning process. So I think it, it's um, about, because um, if you can find that you can live closer to one or two of those values, even if it's not all of them, mm -hmm. um, then that can impact on your mental health. Um, so when I was working in inpatient settings, we always said that actually if somebody is discharged into a community, uh, back into community, there are three things that maintain someone's mental health and well-being. And the first is to have a roof over your head that you can call home. 
Mm -hmm. um, and that has to feel safe and secure. Now, that might be a flat for somebody. It might be shared accommodation for somebody or it yeah. might be their own home. Um, but they have a bed there and they have warmth and they have safety. And back to that Maslow, you know, hierarchy. Yeah. But, but then um, they have occupation. Uh, now, occupation doesn't mean work. It might mean work, but it might mean activity. It might mean something that's um, important to them that they value doing. That might be a sense of giving back to community. It might be engaging in uh, voluntary organizations, um, mm -hmm. for, uh, for example. Um, and, um, and then um, the, uh, the final bit of that is that giving back to community is that mm. sense of being able to um, engage. And if you look at people who have kind of, um, they change their entire life from a life of trauma and suffering and come back out, they usually end up running kind of like um, um, uh, voluntary organizations. Yeah. They become CEOs yeah. or they become um, um, com uh, very um, passionate about a particular subject area. Yeah, absolutely. So those three things are, are really important for mental health. Yeah, I think it's that lived experience element of it as well when people then go into like the sector. Um, so yeah, and then yes, we have got time for the final question, which is great. And it's a good question. It's what do you think the university wellbeing teams can be doing to support LGBTQIA plus students more effectively? Yeah, so... I think kind of um, that. I mean, I think the first thing is about a visual presence and being really um, visual. I think we have to shout out. Um, I mean, I kind of. Um, um, I've been around long enough to, to kind of remember the Navajo charter mark, um, and um, and of course the, the the new charter mark that you have in mm -hmm. terms of uh, working with organisations and the importance of that. I mean, I I can advertise in terms of, as private therapy and say um, that I'm an affirmative um, therapist, and I can put the um, the flag up on my my website. But uh, if you're going into an organisation, need to be able to see. So as a gay man, I want to be able to go into my my GP's surgery and see that actually I don't have to ha um, question who I am. I can be quite open about it. Um, I want to be able to see that in university, not just for um, students, but for um, the staff that work in the organization too. Yeah. Um, so I want to see the flag flying everywhere in, in February. I want to see more, um, when I go to the library, I want to be able to see um, books. I want, I want to be able to see uh, a celebration of LGBTQ+. Um, diversity mm -hmm. um the magazines information um i want to feel as though i belong and i think that's not that, that's about the university as a whole working uh, working on that yeah i also want to know that the um well-being staff um are trained to work um, um and understand um or that they have there's a representation of people from uh, from the community in in terms of the well-being staff Mm -hmm. um, um, so there's lots of, and I think these are basic things. I don't think these are, are magical things that, um, or expensive things that need to be done. Uh, they're very basic things. And I think a dialogue. I think actually probably even the first thing before all of that is having a dialogue with people, with their own students who are from uh, our communities um, and asking them, what is it that you need? What yeah. would be helpful for you? Um, and truly listening to people. And that starts with having a good, uh, a good sit down, a good conversation, but asking meaningful questions. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that means we have to ask the community what questions they want to be asked first. Yeah. Before we can listen. Definitely. Definitely. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Brian. Um, that actually concludes us right on time. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any time for the comments or any more questions, but I want to thank everyone for coming um, and mainly thank Brian for being here. You're an absolutely superb speaker. I think we've all learned something from you today. Um, and of course, thanks to Mark as well, our BSL interpreter, and Lewis as well, of course, for the introduction. So I just want to remind everyone that we'll um, send out the evaluation forms tomorrow and that this uh, recording will be then put onto the YouTube if you wanted to share it with anyone that you thought might be interested in what's been said tonight. Um, yeah, and we're also going to be having another one of these sessions on the 10th of June. 
um, with members of Hadaya, which are a queer Muslim um, charity. So that will be looking at LGBTQ plus mental health in the Muslim community. So that'll be very interesting. And yeah, stay tuned for the promo material around that. And you'll be able to sign up again if you want to. All right. Thank you. Any concluding remarks, Brian? No, just actually, it's a, a pleasure. I mean, I get excited about all of this, but um, um, and it's nice to connect with people, and um, yeah. I'd be happy to to, to come again. Um, but um, just very much, yeah, it's fun, and I appreciate um, talking to people. And if that helps anyone, all all the better. Um, but it, it's been great. Yeah, I really enjoyed absolutely. myself. Absolutely. And and thank you very much, uh, Mark, as well, and Brian for for helping us do this thing tonight it's been fantastic thank you so much yeah all right thanks everyone we'll leave it there well thank you for joining us this evening thanks mark thanks lewis thank you everyone Thank thank you